our first speaker of today is uh, Dr. Pamela Rickley from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, um, where she leads a lab group and is involved in a lot of programs related to air pollution. Um, she was a research scientist at NOAA before, but I also don't want to say maybe too much about your CV, Pamela, because I'm sure that you will introduce a little bit your career path and how you ended up where you work today. Uh, but the reason why we invited you is that we all were very inspired to learn about how you can make an impact as a scientist in a state um, department with very important questions like uh, emissions from uh, oil and gas activities. I'm Pam Rickley. I work for the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, or CDPAG, and this is through the Air Pollution Control Division, APCD. I am the supervisor for the Oil and Gas Mobile Monitoring Unit, which resides within the Air Toxics and Ozone Precursor section. I know that's a lot of acronyms to throw out in the first 30 seconds, but don't worry, you don't need to remember those moving forward and I'll reintroduce them. Um, but before we get started, I do wanna say how happy I am to be here and be a part of this seminar series. As I was considering transitioning from academia, a seminar series like this would have been really helpful for me to see what was out there. So I'm really glad you're here and I'm glad that I can be a part of it. Today, I'll address these questions here as I walk you through the journey that I took to get to where I am today. I'll specifically answer the why and how I chose this path, what it is that I do now, and why I feel that that is important, and also how my background did and did not prepare me for work outside of academia. So my why and how are somewhat intertwined. Before I started undergrad, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew that I had an interest in math and science, but I didn't necessarily know if I wanted to pursue a career in those fields or what that might be if I did. So when I started my undergrad at Indiana University, I started by taking a lot of exploratory classes, and I eventually wound up in the geography department, which at the time housed the atmospheric sciences program. I found that I really enjoyed learning about um, the atmospheric structure and composition, atmospheric processes, and the application of mathematics to understand atmospheric principles. So by the end of my undergrad, I felt like I was starting to find a career direction. And then in my final year, I learned of an atmospheric chemistry lab on campus. And through discussions with that professor, I thought it could be a good fit for me. So I began assisting in his lab. And this lab focused on measuring and understanding the hydroxyl radical. So I started by performing very simple chemical modeling to understand variable rate constants. And so I felt like I was finally finding a, a research direction to go into. And so I wanted to continue those studies and continued on to a master's program. During the master's program, I uh, started to learn the instrumentation. I started with the laboratory kinetics instruments, but this lab also performs field work. And I was offered the opportunity to participate in a field deployment. So during this time, I also began learning the field instrumentation, as well as the many challenges associated with field work. But through those challenges, I found um, a research direction that was fulfilling to me. I really enjoyed the kind of real world application of those measurements. I enjoyed sampling an air mass and uh, identifying the chemistry that was occurring in it, doing back trajectories to identify potential sources of that air mass and what it was gonna mean downwind. Would it lead to ozone or particulate formation? And I enjoyed this specific work so much that I continued on to a PhD. And there are only a handful of locations in the world that do this specific work. It's, as I said, measuring the hydroxyl radical, but they do this through uh, laser-induced fluorescence. And I enjoyed that uh, technique as well as the research goal. So I decided to continue on at Indiana University. During this time, I participated in several field deployments, all ground-based um, in, in uh, pristine uh, forested environments. 
And at this time, I also continued to develop my chemical modeling skills uh, using more complex chemical models to evaluate the chemistry that was occurring um, in those air masses based on um, the field measurements. And then as I finished my PhD, I left Indiana for a postdoc here, or here in Boulder at NOAA. And this opportunity allowed me to expand on my field work experience from ground-based to aircraft research, which was very exciting for me. It allowed me to continue using the same measurement technique of laser-induced fluorescence, but now I was applying it to measurements of sulfur dioxide, or SO2. During this time, I was also able to expand on those real-world implications through studies of biomass burning smoke bloom or evaluations of concentrations in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere in order to apply to measurements of Asian summer monsoon lofting of compounds further up in the atmosphere or just a general baseline of these concentrations in the event that in the future we move forward with any kind of climate change mitigation strategy. So I really enjoyed those real world implications that could be um, worldwide. And as my time was coming to an end at NOAA, I not only reflected on what great experiences I had had through my PhD and postdoc, but also on what it was going to mean for my future. And I was kind of at a loss because all I had ever really known career-wise was based in academia. But I knew that I didn't want to teach, and so that really restricted my options. So um, in addition to this, my lifestyle had changed from the time that I had started in this field. I was now in my mid-30s and had a young kiddo at home, so my priorities had changed. So luckily, being a C series employee through CU at NOAA, I had access to all of CU's free resources, which included career coaching. And when I started working with my career coach, the first questions that we addressed were my interests and skills. And these were the easier questions to answer because I'd been focusing on them for several years at this point. So for interests, obviously field work was a top interest for me, but I also knew that I wanted to apply that to air quality research. And I wanted to be able to continue using um, my technical skills and further developing those through instrumentation. For skills, I developed all of these during my PhD and postdoc, such as research and analysis and the various projects that I participated in. Problem solving, you know, troubleshooting instruments or chemical models. Self-management, anyone who successfully makes it through a PhD develops some form of self-management skills in order to keep yourself motivated to reach those research goals and written and oral communication. So after spending all of this time and effort on my research projects, I wanted to be able to communicate those to various audiences. I'll actually come back to these specific skills later on in the presentation, but from here, the questions required a little more thought. So my preferred lifestyle, well, I wanted a good work-life balance. And as much as I loved those field deployments that I participated in, really didn't offer the best work-life balance. Especially having a young kiddo at home, it was hard to be away for extended periods of time. But I also wanted better job security. I never liked not knowing what was going to happen if our funding ran out or we didn't get the grant that we applied for. Then for our work values, I wanted something that made a difference that would keep me motivated to continue this work. But I also wanted it to be thought provoking. I didn't want to just be doing the same thing every day. And because I was considering careers outside of academia, my career coach encouraged me to explore. And this was through informational interviews and jobs list serves. So my career coach set me up with my first informational interview with someone who had worked in industry for decades. So I was able to sit down with him 
and ask him about his perspective on working in industry and his personal experiences and any tips that he would have for me if I were to choose to move in that direction. But at the end of each informational interview, I would also ask that person for a lead on the next informational interview so that I could keep that going and learn about different sectors. I also began regularly reviewing listservs just to see what was out there and how my interests, skills, lifestyle, and work values could align with those job duties. So if any of you are currently looking for a position, you'll know that this doesn't happen quickly. So after several months of searching, several applications submitted, and many informational interviews completed, a position with the CDPHE and the Air Pollution Control Division became available. And this position was to um, operate a mobile laboratory in the Colorado Front Range. So this ticked many boxes for me. It would allow me to continue field work in a research style format, but in a location nearby. So I could still be home every evening. Being a state position, it also offered um, uh, uh, job security. And the fact that the measurements were aimed towards um, protecting our communities was really motivating for me. So I applied, interviewed, and got the position. But this is also a very interesting time to start working at the APCD. At this time, the APCD was undergoing tremendous growth. And the program that I had joined actually broke off and formed its own program within four months of me being in the job. And this was because there was new legislation aimed at um, measuring air toxics. So we needed to be able to grow our operational efforts towards monitoring specific air toxics. And because we had few people and a lot of work to do, we needed people to step up and help guide the development of our program. So I volunteered to uh, step in as a supervisor in the interim and work towards that goal. Um, I, I have some really amazing coworkers, and as a result, we've grown the program into what it is today, and I've stayed on permanently as the supervisor. So before I get into the work that I do now, I first want to give you a general overview of the Colorado State Government. And I recognize you can't read the majority of the text here, it's more just for guidance. But within the executive branch, that's the governor's office. And the governor is responsible for overseeing the offices of the governor, which manage these agencies here. The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, or CPG, is this whole section here, with the Air Pollution Control Division, APCD, making up a small portion of that. So if we look at the APCD organizational chart, again, I know it's text you can't read, <laughs> um, the light blue boxes, these are the different programs, and they all have a different direction for addressing air quality within color. And the air toxics and precursor program here in red makes up a small portion of that. So the structure of our program is such that we have a manager that oversees the four units. And starting with the oil and gas monitoring unit, or own unit, which we call it, this is the unit that I supervise. And we perform measurements of emissions from oil and gas facilities in order to assess how much of those emissions are reaching nearby communities. To the right is the stationary air toxics unit. They perform stationary measurements to determine long-term trends of specific air toxics all throughout the state. The mobile air toxics unit further to the right performs mobile monitoring of, uh, of, to, to address the legislative requirements for monitoring those specific air toxics from specific facilities. And then over on the, light, the right, the, excuse me, the left, <laughs> 
is the Data and Quality Assurance Unit. So they perform um, auditing of all of the instrumentation within our three monitoring units, as well as uh, data processing and data analysis at times when we need uh, that additional support. So air toxics have become a focal point in recent years, and they are identified as pollutants that are known or suspected to cause cancer or other serious health effects or adverse environmental effects. And within the OM unit, these are specifically BTEX, so benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylenes. And Access to accurate and timely air toxics data is important in order to be able to protect the public health. So our mission within ATOPS is first to conduct ambient air monitoring for air toxics and other pollutants throughout the state of Colorado. Within the OMINA, as I mentioned, this is us measuring emissions from oil and gas facilities to see how much of those are reaching the communities. Second, we provide data that helps guide policy, policy decisions and practices that promote a safer and healthier Colorado for all. So within the own unit, this is communicating with the policy program on long-term trends that we see, or communicating with inspectors when elevated concentrations are observed. And third, we provide data that helps inform public health responses. So when elevated concentrations are observed, we provide that data to the toxicology program who can perform an assessment of a potential uh, exposure to those communities. We then work with them to communicate these to the communities. So why is our program important aside from the potential health effects of air toxins? Well, the EPA air tox screen estimated ambient concentrations within 2020 throughout the state of Colorado to be these values here. And I just want to highlight benzene, which is roughly 9 ppm. And just for, uh, just, uh, for uh, guidance on that, there, the Colorado State Health Guideline value for benzene for one hour of exposure is 9 ppb. So this is a thousand times greater. But I don't mean to alarm you. <laughs> Remember that this is an estimate for an entire year's worth of activity over the entire state. So what this estimate highlights for us are the activities that are leading, leading to these high concentrations. Oil and gas being one of those. So by performing ATOPS monitoring, we can inform legislation and regulations and also identify any non-compliance. So the data we provide can help regulators to work with communities or the pollution sources in order to reduce those emissions. And this is typically in the form of modification to rules or emission standards or implementing new technologies. But the main goal for monitoring overall is protection of the public health. So how do we do it? Well, I would say that roughly 50% of our daily work requires applying technical skills. This is in the form of understanding and operating advanced instrument techniques and theory, problem solving to troubleshoot those instruments at times, programming, we sometimes need to change the uh, sampling frequency uh, for monitoring, or implement uh, some kind of automated task to make our efforts more efficient. We also assess instrumentation to see if new technologies can advance our operations. And then I would say that roughly 30% of our daily work involves data analysis. So this is in the form of statistical analyses and comparison of new data to historical data to identify any changes in trends. We also perform comparative analyses when we're assessing those new technologies, because we're not just interested in the technical aspect, but we're interested in the data output too, in comparison to our current operation. We also perform quality assurance and quality control tasks in order to validate our data before we share it. And then I would say that roughly 20% of our daily work 
uh, requires communicating those results. And this could be to the public, industry, or government, which all require different levels of technical language. But the main point to take away from this is that these are all transferable skills, which I'm guessing each of you already has. So these are hard and soft skills, skills that can be applied from various backgrounds, or skills that can be strengthened or developed uh, to hold value across careers. So if you're interested in a position that requires data analysis of a data set you've never worked with, I'm guessing you have extensive experience with data analysis with large complex data sets. So you're still still apply. Within the own unit, we perform different types of monitoring, one of those being mobile monitoring. Here on the left is a picture of our uh, mobile laboratory which is equipped with analytical instrumentation, GPS, and a meteorological station. So to perform these measurements, as shown in the image on the right, we identify a potential source of emissions, and then we drive along public roads around that facility. Using the wind data, we can identify the direction that those emissions are coming from. And by performing upwind measurements, we can further narrow down the source of those emissions. When elevated concentrations are observed, we then communicate those results to the inspection team who can then go on site and work with the operators to address any leaking infrastructure in order to reduce any further emissions. So you can see where those technical, analytical, and communication skills come into play on a daily basis. We also perform anchored monitoring. So this is just stationary monitoring at a given location for an extended period of time. And the complexity level of anchor monitoring can vary from the more simplistic photo ionization detection, or PIDs, shown here on the left, to the more highly advanced instrumentation of gas chromatography or cavity ring down spectroscopy. Those are housed in trailers, which are shown in the middle and on the right. Any of these assets that are also equipped with meteorological stations would be placed in between an oil and gas facility and a community so that we can assess where those emissions are coming from and how much are entering the communities. So this is what my team focuses on, but what is it that I specifically do for our program? My roles can be defined by the four terms here. I manage supervise, communicate, and budget. I manage our air monitoring programs within the own unit, and I do this by expanding our capabilities, identifying new technologies that can improve our operations. I determine asset priority. There are always more locations wanting monitoring than we have equipment available for. So I have to assess um, based on the projected community impact as well as the operational feasibility at that location, if we can perform monitoring and what asset would be best to do that. I also determine program direction. So I determine what works for a program and what doesn't and how we can grow. And then I determine deadlines. So deadlines for monitoring at a specific location or deadlines for assessing new technologies. Next, I supervise people. So this requires me to be involved in the day-to-day -day tasks of my team members, but it also requires me to learn their individual communication styles. So how they respond to feedback or changes in priority. As a supervisor, it's also helpful to, it's also important to help them grow in their work. So this involves communicating with them on what their future goals are and finding ways that I can help guide them towards reaching those goals. Next, I communicate with stakeholders, and this can be directly or indirectly. This could be the policy program, inspection team, oil and gas operators, concerned citizens, manufacturers. They all require different levels of technical language. And lastly, I budget. I'm responsible for the planning and monitoring of my unit's budget. So I determine what we need for our operations, and then I work with the fiscal department to 
uh, develop contracts and purchase orders in order to maintain those operations. <laughs> So how did my background prepare me for success outside of, of academia? Well, through my PhD and postdoc, I developed important research and information management skills. So this includes how to identify sources of information that are applicable to a given problem, how to comprehend large amounts of data, and how to effectively sort and evaluate that data into useful information. So an example of this in my current role is when budgeting. I have to determine what our needs are and how we can grow our effort. I then research different vendors that can provide the um, uh, services or goods that we need. And then I sort and evaluate those based on priority levels for our team, as well as how they can fit into our, our allowable budget. My background also taught me important analysis and problem solving skills. So this includes how to define a problem and identify potential solutions, how to design a test to evaluate those potential solutions, and also how to, deform, how to form and defend conclusions. So an example of this is growing our monitoring efforts. So those PIDs that I showed a few slides back, those are great. They're uh, simple sensors, so they're easy to deploy, low maintenance, but they only provide total um, volatile organic compound concentrations, which isn't exactly helpful for the work that we do. So when a new technology became available that combined the PID technology with gas chromatography technology, it was an instrument that could potentially um, allow for that ease of deployment, low maintenance, much lower cost than a typical GC, but provide speciated VTEX measurements. So it seems like something that could really grow our efforts and provide more useful information. So I designed a test to evaluate this new technology side by side with our current gas chromatography. And the results we're getting are very promising. We're seeing a good correlation with good agreement, which means we can be more confident moving forward with purchasing more of these to grow those efforts and provide more useful data. My background also uh, set me up for self-management skills, such as how to work effectively under pressure to meet research goals, how to comprehend new material and quickly, and how to work independently. So my unit is not responsible for emergency responses, but there have been a couple of instances where we've had to respond quickly. These were instances in which one event had concerning activity occurring and another event where there was a sensitive population that was potentially being exposed to harmful. So I had to quickly understand the activities that were occurring at each of these sites where they were and limitations to monitoring them. I had to determine which assets we had available that would be appropriate for that monitoring. And I had to work with my team to develop a deployment plan quickly, but also as safe as possible. And throughout this process, I was communicating with upper management on what our plan was, when we were deploying it, and what we were observing as we were deploying. My background also taught me important uh, written and oral communication skills. So how to effectively organize and communicate ideas, but also how to explain those um, in varying complexity, as well as how to use logical conclusions to answer questions. So this uh, is involved in many of my communications. When I communicate with the policy team on specific monitoring equipment that we would recommend for regulatory purposes, or uh, communicating with an oil and gas operator about observations we made around their facility, communicating with manufacturers on the um, types of uh, 
technologies that we need to improve our efforts. Or even communicating with concerned citizens about the purpose and efforts of our monitoring. So you can see how those all require uh, different styles of communication in order for that conversation to be successful. And while my background set me up for success in many ways, the way in which it did not prepare me for work outside of academia is through leadership and project management. So while I had participated in several conferences and regular group meetings, I was never responsible for facilitating those meetings. I never set the agenda. I never guided the conversation um, to in an adequate way in order to also meet those time constraints. I also was never responsible for motivating anyone but myself um, to reach research goals. And while I had participated in many projects, there was always someone above me who was responsible for managing that project from beginning to end. So I never developed the skills to identify and assign tasks for that project or prioritize those tasks while also anticipating potential issues. But I've been able to overcome this, mainly through trial and error, <laughs> but also by asking for guidance from upper management or specific problems that they could help guide me in the right direction. And as a result, I've seen tremendous growth in my team. We've accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. So adding these all together makes for a well-rounded skill set in any sector. If you already have these skills, then it makes you a highly desirable candidate and sets you up to meet more job requirements right off the bat. But if you don't have all of these right now, that's fine too. It's important throughout your career to continue to grow. So identifying those areas of growth now can help prepare you. So as I made this switch from academia to working for the state, I identified a few differences between the two. The first difference is that when working for the state, it's important to remain neutral on your perspective. So instead of advocating for a specific change, it's more important to communicate your observations in, in terms of the science. So this has helped me to maintain trust with both the public and the oil and gas operators. Generally, not a lot of trust there. <laughs> um, the state also has stricter applications of research. So academia typically focuses on um, topics that are interesting and advance the field. Whereas with the state, we work towards achieving a course of action related to a specific policy. There are also different timeframes for data collection and program development. So in academia, it's often the case that there's com competition to um, be the first to publish on new research. Whereas with the state, we work towards longer term projects because we're interested in the longer term observations at effects. The state also offers better work-life balance. In academia, you may be expected to work all hours, day and night, and on the weekend. But with the state, you're only expected to work 40 hours a week and not on the weekend. So this has been a huge relief to me because I don't feel um, that I need to be working longer hours. And when I do have time off, I'm able to more easily enjoy that. And lastly, uh, the state has better job security. And that's because academia relies on soft money, whereas the state relies on hard money, meaning that those state positions are going to be funded for longer periods of time. So if any of you are considering uh, switching from academia, these are some free resources from CU that I found to be really useful. And each of these are linked directly to the web page. So if you have access to the presentation afterwards, then you can find those. Um, the My Skills link will help you to identify skills that are in demand in any sector. 
the career exploration link will help you to identify um, your strengths. The resume and cover letter help will help you to format those um, job application materials um, towards that specific sector. And if you are a CU alumni, then you have access to their um, career fairs where you can meet a variety of employers. But if you're not, there are other career fairs as well. And you can even just network at conferences with manufacturers just to see what types of opportunities are out there. But if you're interested in career coaching the route that I took, then I've heard really amazing things about Elizabeth Edon. She used to be in academia and she transitioned to the private sector several years ago now. And so she understands the challenges, but also the rewards of um, transitioning from academia. So I've included her webpage here in case you're interested in additional information. So my recommendations, if you are considering switching, are to make lists, identify what motivates you, what your skills are, what your interests are, and explore. Just see what else is out there through networking or job fairs or listservs, informational interviews. There are several resources out there just to find out you know, how your skills might fit in with that. Also, identify your transferable skills. So those skills that can be applied across various careers. But also identify where you can grow, because you can always grow. So it's important to identify that and start working towards to set you up for success. And last, have others review your materials that work in that sector, just in, as a way of strengthening those application materials, because they, they can vary by sector. And really, making a career choice at any stage is daunting and your perspective might change over time. But continuing to grow and identify additional opportunities is only gonna set you up for success and help you identify what's important to you. So with that, thank you for your time. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Pamela. That was very inspiring. And thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences from transitioning from academia to the governmental sector and for all your tips. Uh, we will share the slides so you will have all access to the links. So I think we have about 20 minutes for questions before we break. Uh, can you tell me about uh, how you practice those policy and regulations during your PhD work? So I should clarify, I, I don't focus on the policy side. We have a policy team. So we provide our observations or recommendations for specific monitoring equipment or trends that we find in the data that we can then incorporate into policy. So yeah, I, I don't have, my background didn't provide me with policy skills, but I focus more on that research that informs their decision. Uh, I have, uh, thank you very much for sharing in here, especially the, uh, the skills that are needed for transitioning from uh, email to the uh, state job. So I, I have a question, uh, two questions actually related to this transition. So uh, since you're transitioning from an academia PhD degree to a state job, what do you think is the core skill that you obtain from academia that make you more on the edge? In, in the state job, and on the other hand, what do you think is the skills that you obtain from academia that are excessive when you are applying at your state jobs? Very good question. Um, I guess the the strongest one would have been my research and analytical skills in order to solve problems. Any position you get, there are going to be problems you have to solve. So being able to identify what that problem is, potential solutions, how can you address those? problems with those solutions and you know what kind of conclusions you can come to. I would say that that was the strength. Um, and the other question was uh, essentially what skill did I not need? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know because I feel like I use all of those skills. I'm almost writing. I don't have to write papers anymore. Thank you.
but also their answers to those questions. And we narrow it down to a, a specific set of candidates and interview from there. I wouldn't say that you have to know someone because I've certainly hired people that we didn't know. <laughs> but um, but I, I think just networking in general and getting to know what jobs are like before you apply can help you in that process as well. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that you don't have to write a lot for the job, and I was wondering what are some of the metrics of success? Like if it's not published or perished, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So um, for the state government, uh, we don't really get emails for, and that is another difference. I almost put that in there, but um, yeah. So in academia, you get teaching or um, teaching awards or research awards um, or uh, I was like papers, things like that. But yeah, in academia, you might be acknowledged by your coworkers. <laughs> or within your department, but that's it. And for me personally, that's fine. I don't I don't need to be publicly acknowledged. Um, I prefer more low key. But, yeah, I guess I'm thinking about like, if you were to apply to another job or a promotion, like, what would you like put on your resume? This is evidence or like the reasons why. Yeah. Um, so that would be just things that you participated in that uh, relate to that specific position. Like when I applied originally, I knew that it was a position to perform field work. So I listed all of the field, um, field campaigns that I participated in and identified the skills that I had from that. You know, operating advanced instrumentation, forming data analysis, troubleshooting, those types of things. Just yeah, you don't have to have a number of publications to show that you're skilled. Um, yeah, great talk, Pamela. It's very interesting. Uh, so I have two questions. So the first one is uh, for the application materials for applying to government jobs, state jobs like this. So how is it, like, would you share a little more details about, you know, the CV uh, is different from, like, CV or like say the private industry one page resume and what other application materials and how much can you put in? Uh, that's the first question. And the second one is uh, you mentioned that as a part of your job description that you also like monitor non compliance, right? So I'm wondering if any entity uh, is non compliant with say the state rules of emissions. Uh, in that case, how do you deal with that? Like, what is the procedure? Uh, that's yeah. Okay, so your first question um, is about application materials. So, uh, yeah, government positions generally are interested in a CD. They want a one page resume because they're not going to read through every maybe list on there. So, the more concise you can be and the more numbers you can provide. I participated in 15 field deployments. You know, Something like that. Um, not necessarily listing them out unless you want to, because um, you want to highlight, you know, the organizations that you work with or something. But um, yeah, keeping it brief, but very to the point and directed towards the skill set needed for that. Um, and that's where that um, for letter and application materials hopefully can help you with that. Um, and then your second question of when, sorry, when um, there was not compliance. So we performed that monitoring. We identified when emissions are exceeding the permitted values. We communicate that to the inspection team because we're not allowed to go on site and work with those operators. So the inspection team will go do a surprise inspection, uh, work with the operator to identify where that leak is coming from and fix it. If it's an issue, if it's an ongoing issue, then that site can be shut down until new technologies are implemented. And that has been the case previously. So those are the steps that we would take. Hi, Pamela. Thanks for the talk. I have two questions. So first one, uh, can you please share kind of the interview process for applying a government jobs? Because since you the, the jobs that they require a bundle of documents. I'm wondering what are the purpose for each materials that they are looking for? And then second, 
So as you share your experience that you found there are skills that you're already prepared uh, or have been gained during your education and postdoc experience, but there are some that don't, you don't. So I'm wondering when you, you also have interviewing experience. So uh, what do you think that make you think that the candidate that fits the job? Because you know, they have something that fits, but there's something that don't. So I'm wondering what kind of make you think that, okay, this is the person that our team want them to join. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So the application materials, I'm sorry, I'm probably not going to remember all of them off the top of my head. Um, there's the resume and that, you know, it's just a um, brief description of areas that you have worked in, the skills that you've developed in that particular job that you've, that you're coming from or previous jobs. And those can be important to align with the needs for that position. And then in the interviewing process, it can be really difficult to identify who is the best candidate. So we have a hiring committee and we have a spreadsheet where each question that gets answered gets a numerical value from each uh, hiring committee. Those all get averaged together. And that's one way that we identify the top candidates. And sometimes they're very close and we just have to make a choice and I can't point to one specific thing because it could be different um, from person to person, but it is competitive. It's, it's definitely becoming more competitive and I'm sorry, I don't have more better advice. <laughs> more questions in the room? Thank you. Um, my question is about the transition, and you commented on this, um, the transition from being a research scientist more over to being a project manager. And I think you mentioned it was a lot of trial and error and mentorship from people above uh, to guide you through that process. But I wonder if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on some of the specific challenges of that period where you're figuring it all out and how to run a team. Right. Yeah. So definitely uh, learning individual communication styles. You know, I, I mentioned I never had to motivate anyone else or assign tasks and people handle language in different ways. Um, so I might say something to one person and I'm like, all right, I got it. And the other person's like, whoa, where is this coming from? You know, um, or some people like to have their tasks lined up in a certain way. So when you change a priority on something that kind of, I don't, scare isn't the right word, but um, kind of sets them back and they're not ready to move forward with that priority because they were set to work on something else. So it's a way to communicate with them that, yeah, I know you're planning to work on this, but this other issue has come up and we need this to be worked on instead. Let's talk about how we can get you started. Just a way to kind of like get them talking through it because as they start to talk through it, they start to realize, oh, this isn't as daunting of a task as I think, and I can manage to handle this. So that was a learning new communications was definitely um, challenging and applying that to, you know, the policy team or especially oil and gas operators. They can be very defensive <laughs> when you work with them. Um, I had them try to tell us that our measurements were wrong. It's a gas chromatography and it is, it is highly advanced. We are very confident in this. And so we had to talk them through that science and help them understand that, no, it wasn't an issue with our monitoring technique. There is an activity occurring at your site and we need to address that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Um, some of the people that are working for you, do they have master's degrees, PhDs, recent graduates? Um, let's see. So one of them has a PhD and postdoc under his belt. Um, let's see, two, uh, two of them have bachelor's degrees and the fourth one has a master's degree. Nice variety. Yeah. 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 A real quick question about the uh, work. Um, how do you, well, the, uh, the, the work you've done and how often do you reach back to the academia for the, for the uh, guidance on how to make, make the monitoring better? 
do you do that or do you just uh, constantly went back to academia for their new theories or new observation techniques? Um, so it's kind of a mix. I, um, so my team performs the monitoring. They do the data, data analysis. I have to review that data analysis to make sure it makes sense. So I identify any errors or um, any questions of why is this happening and work through that with them. Um, but I also like the PIDs I mentioned. They're great to, to be able to easily deploy, but it doesn't really help our efforts to just provide total volatile organic compound concentrations. It doesn't tell us what amount of those are harmful air toxics. So it, it's continuing, continually working with manufacturers. Once they have your email address, they're going to reach out all the time and let you know if there are new technologies. So just reading those emails and seeing, huh, maybe that could work for our efforts. And sometimes they'll give us a loaner uh, instrument just to try out and see what we think. So we can do that, perform some tests side by side with our more advanced techniques and see how they compare. And if they compare well, then that's reason for us to try to find funding to purchase more of those equipment, pieces of equipment. So you do need additional funding to deploy new teams? Sometimes. Yeah, so the EPA sometimes has uh, grants that they'll uh, uh, put out to the whole United States to um, just money that they have that they'll provide to us. And especially with um, our program growing uh, in Two years ago, it was non-existent. Um, these kinds of grants can apply to us to uh, to add to our resources so that we can grow those efforts. But we don't rely on those grants for hiring people. Those grants are specifically for equipment. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. You mentioned that you didn't have the leadership skills when you started this position, um, but I was wondering if you have any suggestions on how postdocs can build leadership skills because we are all probably under some grants and we are not really managing projects and we probably have self-management skills, but not necessarily people management skills. So do you have any suggestions? Uh, it really depends on your situation. If you're working under someone that would allow you to step into some of those roles or help, you know, guide those uh, or to help guide those and manage those uh, projects, then that would be a great way to learn. And if not, watch what that person does. <laughs> Take notes, I guess. Um, but until you're actually in that position to make those decisions, it's I don't know of another way to prepare other than observations. Okay, great discussion. I think we need to thank our speaker one more time and then have a break for coffee.